So welcome again to a live event presenting a new publication from Terra Nostra Press. So, the name, of course, is Community Matters. We know in the conversations with reflective practitioners about the value and variety of resident engagement in community land trust. I am John Davis, the book's editor. So I'm also the warm-up act today for a remarkable group of organizers, board members, and executive directors whose conversations are captured in our book. I have called them reflective practitioners because they bring both practical skill to their CLT labors, as well as a willingness to reflect critically on what is working and what is not, and to modify their practice when warranted. So I'm going to turn the stage over to them in a moment, but let me first say just a few words about the book's overall purpose and themes. Its main purpose, of course, is to shine a light on the first word in the CLT's name. Community is proclaimed by advocates, practitioners, and researchers alike to be a defining feature of what a CLT is and does. But who is that community? Why does it add value to the whole enterprise of providing housing and improving neighborhoods? How should residents of the places served by a CLT be involved in establishing and guiding the CLT itself? You'd think we would devote as much attention to answering questions like these as we do to writing about and talking about the other components of the CLT, but we don't. The L in CLT is much more prominent in our conversations and our publications. Acquiring land, using land, financing the buildings we put on the land. The T in CLT commands much attention as well. How do we preserve the affordability, quality, and security of housing and other assets entrusted into a CLT's care? As for the CLT, in you know, the C in CLT, well, too often, resident engagement gets neglected or diluted amidst the daily demands of doing development and stewardship, even though community is just as essential to a CLT's identity and function as the other components. So the present publication is a small step toward correcting such neglect. Its point of departure is a sentiment shared by most CLT practitioners, namely that community matters as much as tenure in the work that we do. But you know, after that, things get messy. Practitioners may agree that the C in CLT is important, but they ascribe different meanings to community. They pursue different strategies for giving residents a voice in their organizations. And you know, messy is not a bad thing. Well, I think we've discovered that in this book, we have laid out two major themes, advocacy and variety. The reflective practitioners whose conversations are recorded here are unanimous in proclaiming the virtue and the value of including community in the organization and operation of a CLT. But there is also considerable variation in the ways they pursue that goal. What we learned from listening to our colleagues in Houston, London, Boston, San Juan, and Brussels is that many roads lead to the promised land of keeping community in community land trust. Okay, that's my opening riff on what the book is all about. Time for the real musicians to take the stage. Our plan for today's event is to turn the spotlight briefly on each of the five organizations that are featured in Community Matters, introducing the practitioners who discussed that particular CLT. This will be a quick tour. However, we'll linger only eight minutes in each city, just enough to give you a hint of the sights and sounds 
of resonant engagement to be discovered there. Then at the end of our tour, we're going to ask Teresa Williamson, who wrote the book's concluding chapter, to moderate a short question and answer exchange. As you watch the webinar, just type your comments, or your questions, any that you might have into the chat box in the bottom of your screen. Teresa will direct them to the appropriate presenter for an answer. Well, we're going to begin with the newest and the youngest of the CLTs discussed in the book, the Houston CLT in Texas. Ashley Allen, the organization's executive director, participated in the panel discussion of community organizing that we held last winter. I then had the privilege of doing a follow-up interview with Ashley in March. She makes two appearances in Community Matters, therefore, starring in Chapter 2 and in Chapter 7. Welcome, Ashley. <laughs> so, good, good afternoon. Hello there. Well, um, I think the general question that I wanted to put to you is, uh, what would you hope for the readers to take away from the story that you tell in the book? I would say um, don't underestimate the community. Um, I feel as though um, a lot of our organizations often, um, we have to listen and cater to and appease so many people when it comes to the work that we're doing. Um, to, you know, whoever's funding the project or whichever community you're working in and understanding that communities needs are different. As a citywide CLT, we are working with, um, you know, several communities that all have different needs, different cultures, different histories. And so um, it does take a lot more effort and to be intentional about how you um, support, serve, um, and uplift the needs and wants of that community. But um, don't underestimate their power. Um, but also don't underestimate that everybody, um, because sometimes people in the community are not necessarily for the community, and we've had to learn that as well, is that understanding who you are aligned with, um, understanding what people's values are in regards to the community, um, because people can say they're for the community, but if you don't align, um, the values, the, the goals of that community, um, then you, 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 have, uh, you have some other things that you have to address. In a city like Houston, where gentrification, of course, in many places is happening, but I think Houston felt like it wouldn't happen to them. And now that they're seeing it happen, there are some opposing views within the community. Some are saying, yes, let's you know, develop as fast as we can and create these new expensive places to make Houston um, you know, a world-class city. And in my opinion, in many people's opinions, particularly the communities where the current, re the current residents of those communities feel like you can develop without, you can develop and become a world-class city without displacing the current residents. They can be integrated. Um, you know, the newness can be integrated into the already historical nature and culture of that community. And so I think what I want people to understand is being able to identify um, who, your community really is and who aligns with your values and your mission for the organization and don't underestimate what they can do um, in getting things done uh, because we would not be where we are as an organization without community support because nobody even knew what a CLT really was when we came in except two communities that were, had already been organizing around that for a while. And so now it's become a citywide name. People know what it is, whether you like it or dislike it, you know what a CLT is and, um, and I think that's kind of, you know, to, to uh, giving that to the community and how they've been able to spread the word and kind of promote it. Um, it's not just us screaming, you know, we're great, understand the model, it's fantastic. The community has been pushing it forward as well. You know, I was struck in our conversation by the fact that the Houston CLT walks a tightrope between being a city-sponsored initiative, even though the push really came from the community. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, you've got building a, trying to build a base of support among the people that the CLT serves. So how do you maintain your balance on that tightrope? How do you keep from falling off a high wire when you have the city at one side and the community at the other? Well, 
I'll be fully transparent. We fell off that wire, <laughs> that tightrope wire, uh, and are, are currently having um, some conversations. That's the best way to put it with the city of Houston. But you know what? The safety net under that tightrope was the community because tomorrow we are going to city council and we have people who are signing up to speak on our behalf and speak about affordable housing and speak about the impact of them cutting funding for our program and cutting funding for affordable housing across the board in Houston. And so that's why I say like, you can't underestimate the community. We would not be where we are if it was not for them because the city, of course, in any city government is gonna be volatile. You have changing administrations, people who leave, people who change their priorities. And that's what we kind of saw here in Houston was affordable housing was a prominent um, kind of uh, you know issue and then it kind of became, well, we can do affordable housing, but we're not going to quite do it the same way we were doing it before. Then it kind of just moved away from more like, well, we're just going to do development. And so now the community is standing up saying, but what about communities? What about majority of the people here in Houston? They can't afford a market rate home. What are we going to do if you take away one of the strongest tools we have to create affordable housing? So I will say that it was a fine line and we tried to walk it as long as we could, but with changing priorities, you know, people, you know, things change. And so the community is really lifting us up right now and trying to make a change and get this, the city back um, to making affordable housing a priority. Great. And trying to lift up the Houston CLT in the process. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> excellent. Well, thank you. I know there is a lot more to be said and your chapter is a rich one, both exploring your background and how you came to this work and also the way that you've been promoting the CLT in Houston. So uh, stick around if you can uh, for the questions and answers at the end. There may be some questions that, uh, that people have for you. Sounds good. All right. Well, we're going to now uh, cross the Atlantic to, uh, to the London Community Land Trust. And I believe that we have several members of the, uh, that were part of that chapter with us today. Um, Razia Kanom is the vice chair of the London Community Land Trust. Dave Smith is the former chair of the CLT and was the founding executive director between 2008 and 2014. And that conversation in uh, chapter four was hosted by Greg Rosenberg, who is the coordinator of the Center for CLT Innovation. So welcome to all of you today. So, okay, so here's a very general question for all three of you. And that is, what does the story of the London CLT teach about the variety of strategies that CLT practitioners can use to promote and to retain resident engagement, particularly during the very long development process that it often takes to uh, actually create affordable housing in London. That's my general question. Any one of the three of you can pick that up. Who would like to go first? So, Razi, I don't know if it's more chivalrous to say ladies first or to take on that difficult question first. I'm not sure which of the two is more polite. I'll very quickly say that um, <laughs> what occurred to me was when you write these books and when you have these conversations, you always focus on telling the story of what worked. And you never really think to dwell on the thousands of things that didn't particularly work <laughs> well. And actually, you learn more from those. And so I think, it, I think for me, the one thing to take away is not... This, there's not really a blueprint that you can follow with this. You can't say, well, you should do a shuffle film festival like we did at London CLT, or you should definitely do uh, another e example of kind of community participation. What you need to do is create a spirit whereby you're willing to try these things. And you have a group of people who are excited by the prospect of trying new things and are constantly coming up with new ideas and pushing you to, 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 to innovate. And, and nine times out of 10, it won't work. But the one time that it does, it'll be really, really successful. And you'll probably, although you weren't right about it, you'll learn more out of the other nine as well. <laughs> Razio, what would you add to that? Um, the only thing I would add to that is um, I think it's a bit of trial and error. Um, as Dave said, um, each community's needs, um, each group of people um, have different uh, challenges that they faced. Um, the local areas that they're in, 
um, pre um, present different challenges as well. Um, so it's trying to come in almost blind, uh, taking lead from the community, um, and also trying to have a almost a crash course um, in identifying what will and will not work. And of course, there's key partners to work within those vicinities as well. So it's about it's a balancing act. You talk of a tightrope, um, and I think that's generally what we'll find will be a, a continuing theme, theme throughout um, CLTs all over the globe is trying to find that balance uh, between what the community needs and how to deliver on those, um, whilst also not alienating those who might be um, in opposition to what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Greg, if you were to step back, you were the host of that conversation. Um, what struck you the most? What would you lift up as a lesson, an insight that you learned from listening to these practitioners? I think there's two things. Um, one is the importance of storytelling, where people could see themselves in the stories. And that's something that Dave talked about as well as Razi as well. And then the other thing is about building trust, which is actually earning trust with folks who historically have been poorly treated by the majority culture. And that's something that Razi has spoke to very powerfully. I think we don't always realize that it's important to understand history in order to build trust. And also that we need to be mindful of safe places for people to gather so that they definitely get a welcoming message. So I think those are two things that really struck me that I didn't uh, know as deeply as before the conversation that we had. Yeah. It almost uh, in the your chapter, you gave me a new insight into the T in CLT. I've always thought of it as stewardship and protecting the affordability, the quality, the security of the homes. But you all, you know, Razia, you in particular spoke quite eloquently about building trust as you enter a new community in particular. Um, and that's something that you've had to do because you've not worked in only one neighborhood. So I, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to when you enter a new neighborhood, particularly um, neighborhoods with a large immigrant community, what stance does the London CLT take? How do you enter a new neighborhood? Um, I think something that um, London CLT um, need to be proud of and Dave was um, part of the early movement and I'm not sure how much he realizes this but um, when we enter into these neighborhoods um, we, we are already a part of these communities um, and quite often you'll find this across not just housing um, but often, you know, when you've got that niggling itch or a scratch, you don't get it seen to until it turns into something a little bit more severe. Um, so quite often when we are look, addressing an issue, people are already be, and have already been shouting for quite some time. And I think this is where Dave comes in with his early work. We are, I am incredibly proud of the achievements of London CLT to deliver in East London first and foremost. And um, we know till this day, the social deprivation that exists in that borough of London. Um, and coming from a, a first generation migrant community, um, we've grown up with listening and seeing how it's, how difficult it's been not only to achieve in uh, within the education sector but housing sector um so and i would also add and this is a conversation dave and i have had marginalized communities don't just exist within the uh, uh, immigrant communities either we have our own uh, for want for a better terminology homegrown marginalized communities as well um and that's why it's doubly important that we delivered in east london first and foremost because we do have quite a large working class a white working class community within um east london and you know up and down the country that quite often whilst everybody's shouting their voices also get drowned out um so it's really important that, that when we talk about that trust i can speak from my personal experiences but in trying to deliver for people that perhaps look a little bit more like me or perhaps I hope that there would have been a group of people that helped my parents when they came here um, you meet more 
of those marginalized communities. Um, and the key thing that I think we've done quite successfully um, is listen to what the individual needs of, we have communities within communities, um, and then we have elements of those communities that perhaps are turning a blind eye or a deaf ear to what those communities need. Um, so I think it's really important that when we do engage with them, and we've done this quite well, uh, we take into account all, all of those voices uh, to bring about some, and I'm gonna put a different C, uh, uh, a meaning to the community side is compromise. Um, and we've had to make compromises along the way. Um, and I think, in making those compromises, it goes towards building that trust as well. Um, but coming back to listening to those communities and what they need, um, it's we have done quite well in um, engaging and looking for leaders within those communities as well to lead on that. Um, so we don't go there telling them what they need uh, or what we think we should deliver. We're asking them, how do we deliver for you? Yes. We actually included a quote by Razia as one of the three epigrams at the beginning of our book. Each community is the expert in understanding what their own community needs. So, well, thank you. I, it's a very rich chapter. I'm sorry that we only have eight minutes to hear the story. So look at the book and see the entire interview. So we're going to go to Boston. Now, for our next uh, stop on our lightning tour. And we will see who we have speaking about the Dudley Neighbors Inc. in Boston, Massachusetts. Maria, it looks like you as the host may be the person to uh, tell us about chapter three. Uh, I will mention that um, we interviewed both Jason Webb and Tony Hernandez, uh, who had formerly been the directors of Dudley Neighbors, Inc. in Boston. Uh, they're both now on the staff of Grounded Solutions Network. And the, ah, here we have Jason with us today. <laughs> Hello, Jason. I didn't know whether you had managed to, to make it here or not. And no, um, Thank you, John. Yes, well, welcome. And uh, Maria Hernandez Torales is an attorney and law professor uh, who helped lay the legal foundation for the Kanye Martin Pena CLT in Puerto Rico that we're going to turn to next. But for the Dudley case, uh, we asked her to be the, the host of the conversation. So we have both Jason Webb and we have Tony Hernandez. Welcome to both of you or to rather to all three of you. And I'm going to, uh, to begin with, uh, with Maria, um, who hosted that conversation with the two of you and ask her, um, you know, what was the highlight of that uh, conversation with Tony and Jason for you? I mean, what is the, your main takeaway from the DNI story? Maria. Sí, seguro. Eh, yo quiero que, que eh, nosotros comencemos, ¿verdad? Cuando eh, trabajamos nuestra conversación. Yes, for sure. I, I wanted to start with the way we started our, our conversation. I wanted it to be a conversation and, and for it, it, Dudley. And we talked about the community and it was monolithic. But throughout the conversation, we begin to see that the community because what we call community, it was in two, it was like in two parallel lines. One, the community, in this, in this community that we create with the residents, with the neighbors, where everyone is with what one does, affects the other person. But also in this community where that it affects with what happens in the organization. So as we were talking with Jason and Tony, I was imagining in my in my in my head how this there's the two different levels of community organization. A community being the same community, it is impacted by itself, it is affected by itself. And that same community and how it's its way of acting or taking decisions impacts simultaneously the organization. 
So we we begin to talk about, so we'll go ahead and, and start with what Jason and Tony will share with us, how they were able to make that difference. Honestly, I had not seen that. What is a neighborhood? What is what they would call a neighborhood? And what is a community? The effect of those two things and what is the CLT? So, so how in a beginning, the project begins, they knew how obviously Boston, it was a diverse community, it's many peoples with many backgrounds. So not everything was the same. So there, something that was very important, they said, okay, it's, it's good. It's good and it's, and it's worth that we're diverse. So now let's find what are our similarities? Where are all of us in agreement? So then Jason and Tony were sharing that we are in agreement that we don't like empty lots, the vacant lots. We don't like those, that those are a problem. Also, we're also poor, we're economically poor. We all have low income. And then from there, that's where we move from. So from there, we are looking to from being a neighborhood to being a community. And from there, being able to build our CLT. So now I give the microphone to Jason and Tony for them to expand. Please do. Jason, you grew up in... Uh... Dudley Neighborhood Incorporated, that organization. Uh, Tony, you are were not only the director of DNI, but you are a homeowner. You actually live in a CLT home on leased land. So I am curious for the two of you, uh, you know, what do you hope people would learn from the conversation that is featured in your chapter in Community Matters? Can we start, uh, Jason, you want to start? Yeah, so um, so for, for me, I would hope people will sort of get out of it that for our community land trust, we were created after the community already organized themselves, already came up with an amazing sort of neighborhood revitalization plan. And we really layered this community land trust as the tool around implementation. And for, and for our community, it, it wasn't just about engagement, but it was also about decision making. And I think as what Maria said, this idea of having one, an organized community, but then as an organization really value that that community will be the decision makers is incredibly important. So that's what I hope would folks get out of this chapter. Tony? Yeah, Tony. Yeah. Can you folks hear me okay? Yes, sir. Saludos a mi gente que hablan español por el mundo, que sé que están escuchando, pero tienen Thank interés. you, my peoples who are listening to us in Spanish. I, I know that there's interpretation. Um, yes. Uh, what do you pull away from this book? Um, capitalizing the C and CLT and living in a world where we're trying to figure out um, how to how to put community uh, on the right on the right stool to highlight the power that is behind it and in this book and in this chapter that we had an interview to co-author with with Jason this Dudley story is 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 a, is a matter of for the people by the people um, and that's what allows it to continue to be a powerful movement today is the willingness to continue to let the community be the voice and the controllers of the process. Although we need so many other pieces to help move <laughs> this initiative. If you're not going back to ground zero and communicating with the folks on the ground, I think you're missing the point. Um, and wherever that variable gets plugged in, it needs to be plugged in period. If you're missing that variable, you're missing the point. And so there was a differentiation in the chapter, right? That highlighted, uh, I think Jason uh, ignited it and, and I thought it was a great point 
there's a neighborhood and then there's a community. There's a big difference, right? And in a community, folks know each other, folks engage with each other, folks look out for each other. Um, and you have an idea, you try, to, you, you try to coalesce the pulse of a community um, that, can, that can, in agreement, figure out how to elevate that voice to make that change, to make that revitalization really happen. And so I hope that folks walk away understanding the power that there is in that. Yeah. You know, in the, uh, the minute or two we have left for our tour of the Boston uh, situation here, I wanted to say that I was struck by the fact both with Dudley Neighbors Incorporated and with the Kanyo CLT that you made it, you placed an emphasis on the fact that the CLT doesn't just benefit the people who are living on CLT land. The CLT is there to benefit everyone in the neighborhood. Why is that important? So John, I think it goes back to our founders of this model. And you know, I, I, I actually teach a lot of the roots of the CLT. So, I, so I'm, uh, I'm always struck by, as the model was taken, the urban context, they weren't just thinking about the individual beneficiaries, but also thinking about the entire community and that the benefits shouldn't just benefit those. And I think the connection between Dudley and uh, San Juan is that our former board president, Julio Henriquez, actually had the privilege of spending time as Maria and the rest of the residents in San Juan was looking at their community and trying to figure out this model. So it's, it, it, it's actually beautiful that you also see that fact that you know we're not just benefiting the direct beneficiaries, but everybody in the community can be a benefactor from this model. Yeah. Yeah, the model's designed to be, right, other than direct impact to families that are low income, an opportunity at home ownership, there's a level of influence that happens throughout the community and those engagements in those community meetings, I think creates a level of pride and a level of, 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 of pride, right? That is, is uh, it's uh, infective, right? To other people and other neighbors and, the, and, and, and to have a level of, of proudness around how your property looks and um, right, what the economy can, can be like, all of that intertwines in some way, shape or form. It's, it's kind of a magical thing, right? There is no equation, scientific output behind it, but the influence is powerful in that we're leveling the playing field and it, it isn't a low income saturated neighborhood. It isn't a high income saturated neighborhood, but you come in to be a part of a community, not just a neighborhood. Well, we just mentioned the uh, Cano Martin Pena CLT in San Juan, Puerto Rico. So uh, we're going to move quickly over to San Juan. And uh, if you all are able to stick around for the uh, Q&A session, we'd be most appreciative. But uh, why don't we go to Puerto Rico and Mary Olga Julia Pashako, I am sorry to hear that your generator is going in and out there in San Juan. So hopefully you will be able to stay with us. And um, the other person from uh, the Caño Martin Pena CLT and in Lasse we talked to was Alejandro Corte Morales. Uh, both Mary Olga and Alejandro have been instrumental in uh, leading the community participation efforts at both in Lasse and at the Caño Martin Pena CLT. And Lena Allgood, the vice president of the Center for CLT Innovation, who is also a uh, PhD researcher at the Free University in Brussels and has worked closely with the Caño for a number of years, hosted the conversation. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here today for our, our quick visit to San Juan. So I think the, uh, the question that I would like to put to the three of you first of all is that, uh, that the Community Land Trust in San Juan is different 
than many of the CLTs that we see in the mainland of the US and in Europe. And I wonder if you would speak to those differences um, while also saying what CLTs in other countries can learn from the Kanyo CLT about community participation. So who would like to begin? That's a complicated question, but how is it different and what can people learn from you? Shall we start with Alejandro? Maybe we will start with you if we could. No, you would rather start with Mariolga, preferiblemente. Claro, Mariolga la que comienzo. We will start with Mariolga. Prefer preferably Mariolga. She's the one from the Land Trust. Hello, everyone. I hope that you all are well. We want to thank you for the invitation and for having El Caño present in this conversation as well as in other activities, it's very important that we integrate and that we have international relationships with other groups due to our colonial relationship with the U.S. And that said, and we're great collaborators in the United States that are part of this group as well. That said, in terms of our differences, one of the main differences is that we come to regulate and form, formalize and acknowledge the land rights of families that have occupied these lands for generations and decades. We are a project that began the other way around regarding the traditional sense of land trusts. We already had the people. We had already rescued the land from the government and speculators. And what we did was to acknowledge their occupancy rights, the rights of those families and to solve a tenant situation in the capital of the city. We are near one of the richest areas of the country, downtown bank area. We have the airport historical zones as well. And this was a way to facilitate the communities of El Caño and have them be protagonists in a development program that's going to happen in their community. Alejandro, go ahead. I wanted to add, and thank you for that, Mario Olga, that we started from an integral development plan. We worked with the reality of the community. And then the process led us to believe that we needed to create a mechanism for collective tenancy. Mario Olga had mentioned that there had been occupancy from this area very near the downtown area. They wanted to evacuate the community and develop the area. And we needed to see the reality of the community apart from that reality, create a plan of integral development, have a discussion with the communities, go home by home, street by street. And that led us to believe that a community land trust would give them a sense of permanence and security when they were afraid of disappearing as a community, like many other neighboring communities had disappeared 20, 25 years ago. So that line, and I think Boston is very similar to this. There is an integral development plan. There is a work that is done with the community that is alive. It's constant. The participation is one that is done day by day. And there is not a cookbook. There's not a recipe. The population changes. The context, the country changes. There was a hurricane that just flipped us upside down. So this led us to always have civilian participation. So they were always conscious about their reality. Oh. And Lena, you hosted the conversation. You have visited the Kanyo on numerous occasions. So you had sort of a outsider, insider perspective on what has happened at the Kanyo. And, um, you know, I'm interested in kind of those differences and also what are the lessons from your point of view? Yes, no, sure. Thank you very much, John. And of course, Mariolga and Alejandro have uh, explained very well, really, what the main difference is. But I think I think it would be interesting to like sort of reflect a bit on this notion of community participation, because in the case of the Caño, I would almost argue that it's a bit of a confusing term. It's it's a community-led project. It is a community project led by, by the people. And it's almost like the professionals participate in that project. So it's 
you know, like community participation, it's, 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 it's much more than community participation, right? So it's like, I don't know, like, I think, I think we can reflect a bit on that. And like, in terms of lessons, um, I really think that the Kanyo has shown us that if you really let the community lead, you will reach better results and even quicker. And I think this is a lesson that you can really like sort of, um, you can almost apply it to, to other sectors uh, outside of housing. For example, in Belgium, where I am, we have a very big conflict around traffic, like in neighborhoods, people, like the, the, the municipalities are cutting traffic without any participation of, of, of neighborhood residents. And basically neighborhood residents are saying like, no, we don't want this. We don't want this to happen, right? So basically I think like if, if you really look at how the Canyo works and like how this project really manages to like give ownership of, of, of development of a neighborhood completely to residents in which professionals, you know, engineers, urban planners, social workers, in which they participate, you know, but it really is the residents leading, leading this, this, this project of social change. And I think, I think that is like, it, it's, it's, it's a crucial lesson uh, uh, that, that, you know, that the Kanyo can help, you know, many, many different sectors with. So that's, uh, that's what I would want to add. I like this idea of flipping it on its uh, head here. Instead of talking about how can the community participate, <laughs> you're talking about how can we invite professionals to participate in what the community is already leading. So I think that's certainly one of the powerful lessons of the Kanyo Martin Pena CLT and the Enlace project. So I'm sorry, we could we could spend an hour on each one of these, but we're going to jump over to Brussels and then we will come back to the Kanyo for the Q&A if we can. Thank you for joining us. So uh, to go to the Brussels Community Land Trust, the uh, latest winner of the World Habitat Award, uh, we have Geert de Paul, who has served as the coordinator are for the Brussels CLT since 2012. And we've already introduced Dave Smith from London. We asked him to put on a different hat and to be the host of this conversation where with the London CLT, he was one of the interviewees. So, um, so welcome to both of you. And I think the question that I wanted to start out for the two of you is, um, you know, my contention is that reflective practitioners, as I called all of you in the book, have a rare ability to modify their strategies um, as circumstances change. Um, you know, you reflect on what's working, what's not working, and you're not rigidly hanging on to what you started with. So I was impressed by part of the story of CLT Brussels that you did modify change your strategies to fit different circumstances. So I wonder if you'd speak to that. Geert? Yeah, thank you, John. Um, well, in, indeed, uh, we, uh, we, we did uh, change quite a lot in the way we, we uh, addressed this question of uh, community participation and engagement. Uh, as we started, one of our big questions was, what is this? Uh, what is this community uh, in the community latches we want to uh, we want to start up? Uh, and uh, well, over the years, the the community changed uh, also quite a lot. Um, uh, in the beginning, so as, as we 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 we, uh, we started, uh, as you said, ten years ago, two weeks ago, we we had a big celebration of of this uh, birthday. Uh, we. Um, we started with a group of uh, activists and organizers and social uh, workers, etc. Uh, and we we thought that this community led trust model we heard about would, would be a really good solution for Brussels. But the first thing we wanted to do was to check uh, whether this was also something that was uh, understood or or what 
if if the people we wanted to work with or to do it uh, with uh, also believed in this model. So the, the, at the very beginning of our work, the, the first thing we did was organize a few community meetings in which we organized, uh, in which we invited uh, uh, families in housing need, uh, or community workers, uh, people living in these communities to uh, to present the CLT model and to ask whether this, uh, whether they were as enthusiastic as we were about about this idea, and so uh, from there on we started also to build, uh, uh, yeah, power to to uh, to uh, campaign for this community land trust uh, because as I said in the beginning we were, we were but a small group, so first thing we did uh, was. Um, uh, Talk about it around us and try to uh, motivate uh, community organizations, but also from the very beginning, uh, families whom we knew were looking for a, for a house. And so, um, this was really what uh, helped us uh, convince the regional government in charge of housing uh, to uh, to try. Uh, to give us the opportunity to try to, st to start a community land trust. And, that, and, and this, this was, let's say, the, the first phase of our community work was building this, uh, this power uh, base. Uh, and then uh, from there on, we started, uh, uh, of course, developing house houses. Uh, people could also register as, as um, uh, um, Candidates, homeowner, people who wanted to uh, apply for housing could uh, register. And for us, it was really important to also invite these people to become a member of our community, member of our organization. As uh, for us, it was one of the most important uh, stakeholders. You, you, you have to know that our community land trust is a citywide community land trust, so we don't work in a specific neighborhood, and there is not so much uh, sense of community because between. Well, all these more than a million uh, residents in, in, in Brussels. So um, we invited uh, people who wanted to apply for housing to become member. And then we started also to, we, to test uh, how we could uh, build a community out of this group of, of, of people living scattered all over the Brussels region. It, in the beginning, it was four, five, six hundred families. Uh, who didn't have a real uh, connection, so uh, we tried uh, to uh, use the um, asset-based community development uh, methods, uh, try to con create connection between all, all these people, which worked uh, uh, in a certain way, but but lots of the things we tried didn't really didn't really work, but uh, it helped us. Uh, Learn to to know this community better, and and a few really interesting uh, initiatives uh, grew out of it. Initiatives that still uh, exist today, um, that are really uh, yeah, initiated by these people, uh, by our community members, um, and then in the the following st st uh, phase of our community work uh, was when let's say. Some four years ago, when more and more of our homes uh, uh, started to be occupied by, by the residents, and today we have five different projects in different uh, uh, neighborhoods in Brussels, um, uh, with all between uh, 10 and 30 housing units. And uh, the focus from then on was really on building community within these housing projects. Uh, so we, uh, we, um, uh, organize the, the future residents from as soon as possible uh, before they move into their homes. We give them a, an important role in uh, uh, the design of the homes, also in uh, the organization of the of, of the community within those homes. Uh, we we do a lot of training activities, etc. Uh, and all of that, the, the goal of that is really to well to build community. Uh, but also to um, to help these um, uh, residents to, to to become autonomous and organize themselves uh, uh, their housing projects. Um, 
yeah that, that's that's more or less the, the, the three different uh, <laughs> phases of, of our community work let's say uh, and and today we are we are thinking about well how to adapt it uh, to uh, to the new situation uh, and there, there there's really uh, a lot of things to be to be done uh, we, we, we we want to uh, improve the way we can uh, we involve uh, the residents into our uh, governance they, as in other CLTs, we, we have our, uh, our uh, residents within the board, but uh, there is really, uh, uh, we can improve that, I think. One of the other things is and that we, we see how other CLTs uh, involve uh, young people into their community work. Uh, there, there's really something we can learn from, uh, from what other CLTs do. Um, and, and also try to build more connection between all of these housing projects and not only uh, build community within uh, within the, the housing project, but create connections between people living in different housing projects. Yeah. So what intrigued me about uh, this chapter was we had a community organizer who had helped create a CLT in one city interviewing a community organizer who had helped create a CLT in another city, uh, in another country. Um, Dave, your reflection on your conversation with Geert, what stood out the most for you? Uh, I just think that for me, you, you speak, John, about reflective practitioners, and it's a, it's a kind compliment to us all, but it's relatively easy to be a reflective practitioner when this is your job and you're paid to do it and you have the time. But what gets built in Brussels is a reflective organisation and a whole team of people who are able to read the political situation and respond to it. And I think you see that most of all in relation, perhaps there's a huge amount of overlap to the work Ashley was talking about earlier in, in Texas, because you have an organization that went from being a local small campaign to now one which is a responsible um, collaborative partner with, with local government. And that that speaks to a huge organizing effort, because that's not just one person making decisions, that's, that's collective responsibility across a dynamic and diverse set of people. So contrary to what you read in the press and popular opinion, London learns a huge amount from Brussels, and uh, it was a wonderful conversation to, to be a part of. Wonderful. Well, thank you to the, to the two of you. We're going to uh, uh, encourage people to put your questions and your comments into the chat box, because we're going to turn to Teresa Williamson now. Teresa, are you with us? There you are. I am indeed. Uh, all right. Teresa is the executive director of Catalytic Communities in Rio de Janeiro, uh, Brazil, and she contributed the concluding chapter to Community Matters. We had asked her to read all of the preceding chapters and to reflect on that in a concluding essay. So, uh, Teresa, I wondered if you would uh, give our listeners a preview of what they can find in your concluding chapter. And then we're gonna ask you to moderate the Q&A. Go, Teresa. Perfect, thank you, John. Thank you for the invitation to write the concluding chapter to what <laughs> was an incredibly inspiring book. I loved digging into all of them and reflecting on my own work in Brazil um, and just, Everything I've learned since graduate school, I feel like every graduate school planning course should read this book. Um, so uh, in the chapter where I concluded, I tried to look at common strings between the different um, approaches, contexts that sort of surpass the context. Um, and sort of what I came away with was a conclusion that CLTs, well, in the words of Dave Smith, right, they're a lot more than housing. He talked about how they're about, they're they're not about building homes. They're about building, and his words were continually thriving communities. Um, and I like I really believe that that's the ultimate goal of a CLT, a well managed CLT. And I do think that the cases in the developing world, like the ones we work with in Rio and the Caño, where a CLT comes out of community control um, and a demand from the community, or Dudley Street, um, where community demand that a CLT be, be created um, within its own uh, contemplating an existing community. Those are very powerful examples uh, from the start of the community element because they started with community first. Uh, but then you have all these other cases where 
uh, you know, groups, local organizations, nonprofits, activists, build community in the process of creating a CLT. And then as a result, they're doing so much more than housing, right? They're meeting the gamut of human needs. You've got Dudley Street that works on food sovereignty, among other issues. You've got the Caño that develops local leaders. Um, you, there are CLTs doing, you know, uh, creating local businesses, promoting uh, all sorts of other types of development within their territories. Um, and so there's a much more thorough, exam thorough development that happens. And, and I thought that this was really beautifully displayed in the book as I read the different bits and sort of pieced them together um, for, for my, in my own head. And in terms of the organizing itself, the idea of one of the ideas that was shared in the book uh, that I talk about in the concluding chapter is the relationship between building trust, uh, which through trust, which can only really be built through community, uh, you build engagement. Through engagement, you build power. And as a result of that power, communities can pressure for other improvements, again, way beyond housing. Um, so uh, that's a bit of what I talked about in the concluding chapter. And now I'm gonna go ahead to the questions. There were a number of questions posted in the chat box. There were a couple that were practical questions. Uh, so I maybe suggest that Ashley, Jason, Tony, and Gert, you maybe address some of those directly in the chat. There were uh, from Becca about, for example, whether in Houston spending um, is on a re rental affordable units, uh, uh, about whether Dudley Street is a 501c3, and then in the case of, of uh, um, Garrett, uh, whether the homes are all adjacent, et cetera. Um, and then I'll go ahead and pose the common questions here for everyone. Uh, Jenny Madsen asked about jurisdictions like cities and counties in California. I think she was framing the question towards Ashley, but suggesting that uh, others can answer as well. Uh, so Ginny posed, uh, jurisdictions, cities and counties in California seem to be incredibly influenced by the for-profit real estate industry because the budgets of the jurisdictions are so tied to property taxes. This leads city and county governments to align themselves with real estate lobbyists, generally from outside the area rather than the residents' jurisdiction. Uh, residents seem to count less than these paid profiteers. And then she asks if this is the same in Houston, uh, London, Puerto Rico, is this everywhere? And how do we give community residents the sense that they can compete in this arena? So this is the first question. I think several of the questions are intertwined, so I'm gonna go ahead and read them all. Uh, the second is from Stephen Hill. Uh, he follows on and says, how can forms of representative and participatory democracy be seen as natural as well as necessary partners in making just and equitable neighborhoods and cities? The state is not always very keen to recognize the status of communities and treat them with the kind of respect uh, that politicians and public officials ought to be given uh, to the citizens that elect them. Are CLTs potentially rather unique in their legal forms and capacity to bridge that gap and make it as easy for the state to look to communities as partners as readily as they undoubtedly do to the real estate industry? The third question comes from Filippi Litsek in Rio. Um, talking a bit about the informal context in the global south. And I think this question actually does, uh, uh, does fit in nicely with the others, even though the others were, were looking a little bit more at the, the, the traditional way that CLTs are created. Filippi asks uh, or comments, a big difference in the practice with CLTs in the global north and south is that meanwhile in the north, the focus is usually acquiring land for the building of housing units in the south, the CLT is being used on consolidated communities that fight for land rights, communities that already carry a sense of belonging, collective organization. So he asks, how does the CLT embrace the pre-existing forms of organization and solidarity networks typical uh, in communities, including favelas and informal settlements? Are there any tensions between the spontaneous informal ways of organizing and the formal structure brought by the CLT? Uh, and I think this question could be addressed not only in, by informal communities and informal CLTs and informal settlements, but also uh, potentially in the global north. Um, if you think about the traditional organizing that happened before uh, and what comes through the CLT. Uh, then Rachel Elfenbein asks, um, thanks, thanks several of them, thank everyone. And she says, one of the speakers spoke about the diversity within communities. I think she was talking about Razia. Um, there are also conflicts within communities. 
could the CLT spokespeople speak about how they approach conflicts within their communities? And then finally, Robert Dowling um, asks, and I think this is more focused on the Kanyo as well, I understand the power that communities have to influence local decision making, but how can members of a local community know how to accomplish their goals? By how, I mean the technical matters such as zoning, financing, and construction. So now I pass on the questions to each of you. Um, maybe we can start with Ashley. Yes, so to answer, because there was one question about um, Houston CLT, we are home ownership. We haven't moved into rentals yet, but that is something that we're looking to do in the future. So just wanted to um, address that quick question. And um, the question about um, basically developers having the upper hand in decision-making, uh, I can't speak for everybody, but in Houston, absolutely. We are developer town. Um, we are, we definitely prioritize the needs, wants of developers um, and um, construction, which is why we have no zoning here in Houston. Um, I believe we're like one of the largest cities uh, in the country that do not have any zoning. Um, so it allows for um, people to basically buy land and do whatever they want with it. Um, and so that is a huge factor in some of the decision-making that is happening. And because it's such a developer-centered um, city that uh, they also come with a lot of political funds. And so then that also influences uh, decision-making because they have a lot of connections, a lot of pull politically because there are dollars attached to it um, when it comes to who they're going to support. And they're always gonna support the person who is going to continue to say they can come in and build and do whatever they wanna make a lot of money <laughs> um, in communities and that's happening now. So um, the answer for Houston is absolutely priority is given to, um, well, I would say, they have influence, I wouldn't say priority, I'm not gonna say that fully, but they definitely have major influence in how we operate as a city um, around not just housing, but just development in general of communities. And that's why it's a lot harder of a fight because you know the community doesn't have the same financial resources as these developers have, of course. Um, so it's, it's not just fighting for the housing piece, but also the political, um, you know, the political will and power that they have as well to influence through campaign dollars. Thanks, Ashley. Um, I'm not sure if anyone from the Lennon CLT is still with us. I couldn't quite uh, see if Razia or Dave are around. So I might send that word over to the Caño now. Um, Mariolga, Alejandro, Nina. Excuse Alejandro, quien tenía que partir a otro compromiso, eh, pero en términos I'll de la... excuse Alejandro, they had to be somewhere else, they had a previous commitment. I think the first step that we have to give is to acknowledge where the existent leadership comes from in the communities, understand their tenacity, understand the defense that they have, organizations from organizations that come to the community, and through dialogue and creating, building trust, it's something that was exalted amongst the acronyms. Through that, reach agreement and an understanding of what the best practices and the best way to organize is within the community land trust. And we're always here at your service whenever you want to collaborate. Thank you, Maria Olga. Um, oh, good, Maria's here, great. Maria, I couldn't see everybody. I, that talking a little bit about diversity, Jason and Tony are still there, but in our chapter, the conversation that we had, we talked about how diverse the neighborhood was, now the and how diverse the community is, and how the Dudley Land Trust has worked with that diversity, and I would like for them to talk more about that. Also, there's an aspect on how I deal with divergence when there are different ways of thinking amongst the residents or 
amongst people that are near this phase in our conversation. In the book, within our conversation, there's an excellent example about the establishment or the improvement of a business near the area. Tony or Jason, I would love for you to talk more about that. Thank you, Maria. This is Tony. It's me, Tony. Um, one of the questions, right, lent itself to how how residents, right, are able to understand how to move development, how to connect with 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 the city, and how to move agendas forward. One example that I'd like to give folks is that here in Dudley, we created uh, my predecessors created, and I had the opportunity to facilitate and carry during my years at Dudley uh, a sustainable development committee. Um, that focuses is made up of local residents and that committee focuses meets every month and it asks developers engineers architects to come and present on developments that they're proposing for our neighborhood and then we then have uh, an internal discussion right we we excuse the presenters and we have a conversation and we develop letters of recommendation and or against certain projects based on how we think it fits our community. And uh, other than developers presenting at this sustainable development committee that we have, we take time to educate our folks and help them understand what, what zoning is, how to read floor plans, how to understand right the, the language that comes with, with that part of the world. And so that's one way right to really um, educate and empower the people on the ground. That's one methodology that we used here in Dudley, and I'd, you know, I'm sure it exists elsewhere, but I'd recommend it where, where folks may wonder, right? How do we do this? Well, you form these committees and you educate and, and, and empower people with this knowledge so that they can carry that baton forward. Wonderful. I was going to suggest. Maravilloso. Iba a sugerir, Tony, que usted y Jason hablaban, contestaran las preguntas. ¿Le gustaría contestar algunas de las otras preguntas? O quizás Jason se puede unir a usted. Quizás Jason puede comentar, decir algo ahora. Yo comparto el micrófono con mi hermano Jay todavía. ¿Está ahí? Sí, sí, está ahí. So, so for, for, for myself, pues para for mí y para, I'm sorry. So, so for myself and also for Dudley, again, it goes back to that community vision. And that is what you immediately start to buy into. And you actually are a active participant in updating that vision as years go by that help some members that may have differences in the community, that everybody can come around to this shared vision that we all have in Cumpers. And that's what also drives what Tony Hernandez just talked about, that Sustainable Development Committee, is that they have that amazing tool that they are always looking back to to say, does this development fit our vision? If it doesn't fit our vision, then we know how to respond. But if it does, then this is how we're going to interact with this developer. Um, so really having that baseline of that vision helps keep the community in our community land trust at its center. And this is something that I, 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 I nod to John Davis uh, because this is something that Dudley has sort of led throughout the years with inside the network of CLTs and I absolutely love that the book has now come out to continue this conversation is, how do we continue to keep the C in the CLT? Thank you, Jason. I think we're gonna wrap up the Q&A um, with Gert. And um, I know that two other questions appeared in the chat box, three more. Um, I think we're, we're tight on time. But uh, so I'm not sure what might be suggested, but I think afterwards we'll hear from um, John and he might follow up on that. Here. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, I think what what we learned from this discussion is uh, the, and that there is uh, uh, so many uh, differences between all these CLTs and, and all do their organizing, their community organizing uh, uh, in connection with their local situation, but there are also a lot of uh, similarities. Um, in our community land trust, we, we, uh, the community land Community organizing work is really uh, emphasizing mainly uh, to create uh, the best possible uh, housing project, the best possible uh, community within these uh, within these housing projects. Uh, very often, uh, with very diverse communities in 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 not always very easy neighborhoods. So that that is for us uh, the focus to help us also. Uh, strengthen our organization and get more possibilities to to develop more projects and that means also that uh, whereas we we have a more of a background as a activist for the moment we are um, relying on our relationships with other organizations and other networks to do this more of a political uh, uh, work and, and we really focus on uh, on the yeah, healthy communities within our projects. Thank you, Gert. Um, I just realized Dave did come back. So we hadn't heard from you, Dave, in this Q&A. Not sure you heard the questions, um, but do you want to have oh, a final I was, I was, I was here and I heard them. I just... Um, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's quite okay. I've got very little interesting to say to you. I was going to have a stab at Stephen Hill's question, which was about, um, which I think was about a conversation which I know he's been part of for a long time about it's almost kind of the progressive realization that the state can't do everything I think and 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 maybe it goes beyond that and it says not only will the state not do everything but the state shouldn't do everything and can't do everything um and and, and what role therefore housing and and local groups play within the the kind of democracy of that and I just think that's just at the essence of the movement I remember when we started out doing this I naturally was inclined to believe that the more progressive of the political parties in London's government would take to our work quite quickly and that the conservative end of the political spectrum would be against it and actually what I discovered was it was far easier with those on the conservative end of the spectrum because to their mind we kind of added some value to something that they didn't want to fund and wasn't going to happen otherwise and they kind of said well great feel your boots if you want to do that then go ahead with it and that's as good as we're as far as concerned because it's one less thing for us to worry about and one less thing for us to pay for Whereas the whereas the people on the kind of the more supposedly progressive end of the spectrum, certainly in the Labour Party, their reaction was, no, we will build houses for poorer people and you will vote for us and thank us. And and they didn't understand the, the benefits of the agency that local people brought to the process. And despite um, what they might like to think of themselves, they never can be. I think they... My realisation is that inherently they never can be close enough to the communities they represent by nature of their position in order to re represent them as well as local communities represent themselves through the CLT movement. Um, so personally, I thank Stephen for that because it was, it was part of my political education and I wonder if it is the same elsewhere, but certainly that was our experience of it in London. Fabulous, thank you so much, Dave. And I don't know if it was a problem with my Zoom vision, but I couldn't see Razia before. Now I see Razia and it would be wonderful to have you have the final word, Razia, and then pass on I'll pass on, let John take over and conclude our event from there. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Um, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement with Dave and it's been part of my journey as well to realize that actually um, there's certain elements of perhaps more left-leaning um, organizations that have been a, quite a challenge to us, whereas um, some of the more conservative-leaning politicians have been in, in support of us. Um, but I don't think that's out of um, a good nature of them wanting to support us. I think it's got more to do with it fits into a certain element of the capitalist ideology um, that, you know, we will um, give back to the community a financial uh, benefit, which isn't entirely a, a bad thing. Um, but I think what both parties or what most parties fail to recognise is that when a community can take control or when a group of people can cont take control over what's going on around them, uh, they're much more secure. Um, there's much more investment in the people. And 
this the vicinity of businesses, schools, um, and their own community. Um, and that's what makes us stronger together. And I think that's something that's being missed. Um, and coming back to what I said earlier, that each community is the expert in within their own community. Everybody knows what their strengths and um, weaknesses are. Um, and they're much closer to the ground, therefore able to identify who can do what. So much more efficient than relying on local politicians who I almost always feel we're at loggerheads with. Um, but we go back to the drawing board, we go back to our campaigns and we go back to um, our outreach events where the real work is done. Thank you, everyone. I'll pass the word on to John to provide his concluding remarks. Well, I'll just say thank you to all of the uh, participants in today's book launch. You know, they're the rock stars in Community Matters. And if you think these people are articulate in person, you ought to read their words in print because they have a longer conversation with all of them. So um, I'll just note that, uh, you know, Community Matters is one of nine books and monographs that have been published by Ter by Terra Nostra Press since 2020, um, three of them in Spanish. So all of these publications are available in print and as ebooks. Um, I should also say that, you know, we donate a lot of PDF copies of our publications. Uh, we are a mission-driven publisher. Uh, we're more interested in building a movement than in maximizing our profits. But having said that, I urge you to buy our books and monographs if you have the means to do so. That uh, will help us to subsidize those that we give away to community organizers around the world who may have fewer resources than you happen to have. So uh, when you exit this Zoom meeting, you will be asked to fill out a short survey giving us feedback on today's event. So as our gift to you for doing that, we will send a PDF copy of Community Matters to everyone who submits a completed evaluation form. So thank you to everyone for listening in. Thank you to our interviewees, interviewers, and all of the contributors to Community Matters. That's it for today. Thank you very much. <laughs>